So let's continue with the next session. So first speaker of the se uh, second uh, session is the emergence of Riemannian structure from quantum differentials by Sean Majid. And <laughs> please. Thank you very much. I have a microphone, maybe. Uh, do I need it? Hello? OK. So um, I'm going to be, I'm really coming uh, here from attempts over the many years. So that's what this conference is. Uh, are you want me to use that? It doesn't work. Uh, okay, right. <laughs> I suspected, so thank you. So that's what this conference is about. Uh, but what I want to see is what kind of mechanisms uh, by which this can take place. How can classical geometry emerge from quantum gravity? Now, quantum gravity is probably some horrible, complicated, algebraic, combinatorial thing. But the idea is that if you step a little bit away from from classical geometry, you should, it should be some more general notion of geometry which includes quantum corrections, uh, Planck scale physics corrections. And so one postulate for that is that it should be one in which the variables of space-time become operators, so they become quantum. Um, uh, so that's what's called the quantum space-time hypothesis. Um, so we don't know if this is true, but it's just a hypothesis. Once you have assumed that framework, that geometry is really a classical limit of a slightly more general geometry, which is quantum geometry, quantum Riemannian geometry, then this has its own mathematical structure, which you, of which we see only a shadow. Now, this classical, this structure of quantum Riemannian geometry, it turns out to be more rigid than classical geometry. In particular, this map, this map here is not subjective. Not every classical geometry is in the image of a quantum Riemannian geometry. And that's good, because not every geometry should be the real world. The real world should be constrained by things like Einstein's equation. So uh, I'm not saying I'm, I've got there yet, but the idea is, is that classical features within geometry, not just that we have Riemannian manifold, but that we have evolution, that we have um, uh, various features, Einstein's equation, they should be explicable they, to us, they will just appear as ra additional information without any explanation. But within quantum jump, but they will be the shadows of, of constraints or rigidity within the quantum Riemannian geometry. And so that's what I want to show you. Uh, I'm going to, and I'm going to show, just focus on a tiny bit of this. I won't have time to discuss the whole theory. Um, but I'm going to focus on differential structure. So differential structure means just I'm able to use the Leibniz rule. I see the Leibniz is very popular at this conference, and that's how it should be. Uh, so this will be a similar Leibniz rule to the last talk, and there's another Leibniz rule coming up later uh, in, the, uh, in one of the other talks. I'm going to show how nothing but the way the Leibniz rule interacts with the quantum hypothesis, the non-commutativity. Um, will they, it kind of trips over, they trip over each other, and this ultimately is the explanation, philosophically, for why things evolve and for why there is Riemannian geometry in the first place. Okay, this is a very bold statement. I hope to convince you of it. Um, it's a little bit technical because if I had complete answers, I probably uh, would be, um, well, I'd be, I'd be writing a lot of physics papers. This is more mathematics. So, the, of course, what we mean by quantum Riemannian geometry depends on uh, uh, some sort of axiomatic framework. We've got to specify what we mean. And my approach to this is very minimal. I'm only going to assume the absolute bare minimum. So if you don't accept these axioms, you basically don't accept anything, or you've got to tell me what, you, what alternative you have. The assumption, so before I do that, let me just explain that a classical manifold, C infinity of M is the functions on the manifold, has extends to a whole exterior algebra of differential forms. So things like a function F, dx is a differential form. Every function can be expanded with partial derivatives like this. So this is something that everybody should be familiar with, who knows enough geometry. The thing about these differentials is they commute with functions. And this exterior algebra of differential forms, they, you, can, you can exterior product them. So there is a wedge product, which gives you, gives you, given two exterior forms, omega and eta, you get a new one. And D, this D, extends to obey the Leibniz rule. This is a graded version of the Leibniz rule, where you put the degree of omega here. 
And of course, this out Fourier algebra is graded commutative. So it's, it's, a, it's a super version of a commutative algebra. So this is something that everybody who does enough mathematical physics knows. And so what we're going to do is we're going to assume that our algebra A, which replaces the infinity of the manifold, is going to be some other algebra. And we won't assume that it's commutative. So we drop the commutativity. And we also drop this. We don't, want it to be, we don't want the differential forms to be commutative either. So we drop every kind of commutativity. But we do want to have a space of differential forms. So we suppose there is some space, omega 1, which is the space of differentials, of DFs, and um, of, of, of differential 1 forms. And there is a map D from A into omega 1. Now, what properties do we want? Well, we should be able to multiply a differential by a function. So if I have a differential DB, I should be able to multiply it by C. C is another function, an element of A, and get another differential form, omega 1. And then I should be able to multiply from the other side as well. And these two actions, the left and the right multiplication by functions, should commute. This actually is associativity. So this, we require this, it's called a bimodule. So omega 1 is a bimodule. And all I'm saying is, is that I can associatively multiply a differential by a function. Okay? If you don't... Yes, and A is still associative. So thank you. Good point. So A is an associative but possibly non-commutative algebra. Um, and we, we're basically keeping associativity. And so we keep the associative differential forms. We want D to turn a function into a differential. And it should obey the product rule. For, so if you, want, if you know anything from high, if you remember your high school calculus, this is your, the basic thing that characterizes differential calculus. It's the Leibniz rule. So we want that. And, uh, and we want omega 1 to be generated by things of the form ADB. So differential forms are generated by differentials. And the last thing we want, uh, we don't have to have it, but on a, on a connected manifold, uh, classically, it, the only function that is killed by D, which has all the partial zero, is the constant function. So we would like that to be true also. So the kernel of D should be the constant function, the identity function. Um, so that's an optional condition. We won't worry too much about the higher ex extension right away, but usually, given omega 1, we can then take tensor products of omega 1, quotient by some kind of relations, and get a whole exterior algebra omega. So this would then be the wedge product. So we won't worry about that too much, but we would like it to be possible that omega, extend, omega 1 extends to omega with d squared as 0, and obeying the graded Leibniz rule. So we keep that. Uh, something that is not possible classically. Here's the first thing which has no classical analog. But it's very, philosophically, it's very reasonable to expect it. Because you see, D is a map from omega to omega, especially at this point. D is a map from omega to omega, and D obeys a derivation. Now, when you have a derivation on a very non-commutative algebra, is a fact of algebra that the derivation will have to be inner. So there will be, have to be some element of the algebra which generates D. So very typically in the quantum case, there will exist an element theta of omega 1, a 1 form, whose commutator with, with, with uh, anything else, with, let's say with a function, gives you D. This is completely impossible classically, because classically, this graded commutator is always 0. Differential forms commute, or graded commute. So, so this, is, this is a phenomenon which you cannot see classically, but which is very typical in the quantum world. And so what you see in the re in classically is a remnant of this, but you will not see it itself. OK, so, so I, I would like everyone to agree. Uh, I won't ask for a show of hands, but I hope you all agree that this is really the bare minimum. You could go further. You could drop associativity. But within a kind of reasonable associative framework, this is the bare minimum for differential geometry. An algebra, a differential Leibniz rule. OK? Um, now, um, Here's a theorem. Well, you can, this is, what's nice about this framework is you can go and give it to, you know, even if you have, uh, well, you can, give, you can give it to a student or, you know, anybody uh, and just take your favorite algebra and say, classify all the differentials, all the omega ones for any algebra. And since there's lots of algebras, that's going to be, you know, plenty of, of, of years of research grant funding. So if you can find some interesting examples. So, so here's a theorem. It's not as easy as you think. Let's take the enveloping algebra of a Lie algebra. So G is a Lie algebra. You probably, 
the enveloping algebra of a Lie algebra means the algebra with relations x, y minus y, x is the Lie bracket of x, y. So this is a quantization of the coadjoint uh, of G star, the coadjoint space of G star with its Kirillov constant bracket. So if you don't know about that, don't worry, but this is an example of a non-commutative algebra, which is a deformation of a polynomial algebra in, on G star in, in n variables where n is the dimension. So, um, and so what are its differential calculi? Well, this happens to have a translation structure. You can sort of shift the elements of the Lie algebra. They have an additive structure. You can add them. And so, that, so you can ask for translation invariant differential calculi. And they correspond exactly, there's a theorem that they correspond to one co-cycles. Um, and that, so this is a Lie algebra co-cycle. So that means you can classify them. And in particular, if you ask for the calculus to have the same dimension, so translation invariant, connected, classical dimension calculi. So in other words, if, if the generators of, of G are, let's say, Xi, and you ask for a calculus with basis DXI, the same number of, of, of differential forms as there are in the coordinates, that means the same dimension, then it turns out the co-cycle just corresponds to what's called a pre lie structure. A pre lie structure is a product on, uh, on the vector space of the Lie algebra, whose commutator gives you the bracket, but which obeys this weakened associativity condition. It was also related to Jordan algebras in some way. Uh, but we use it in the following way. Given this circle, the, dif the differential forms, x is, a fun is an element of the Lie algebra regarded as like a function. And y is another one, and dy is a one form, and the commutation relations, the one forms and the functions don't commute, and the commutation relations are given by, by the circle product. So that's the theorem. Every calculus on, the, on a translation variant calculus on UG of classical dimension is of this form. You have no choice. And uh, um, an example is the vector fields on a manifold. Um, if you have a torsion-free flat connection, NABLA, then you can define the circle product. Here, X and Y are now vector fields. You can define a new vector field by the covariant derivative. And this is the, these axioms, which correspond to it being torsion-free. They correspond exactly to flatness of this, of this um, connection. This flatness, this is equation for flatness of this connection. But this corresponds exactly to, to, to this up here, or to this identity. Um, if, if you put the commutator here, put this into there. Okay, you can convince yourself this is what it comes down to. So, so in fact, torsion-free flat connections are exactly the same thing as pre lie structures on this, on, this, on this Lie algebra. But another example is, um, is angular momentum space, so USU2. So what am I doing here? This is the usual epsilon here is the usual anti-symmetric tensor. So this is the one which everybody who does quantum mechanics already knows. This is the algebra of angular momentum. But we are regarding it as as coordinates regarding the x mu, not as angular momentum generators, but as coordinates of a quantum space time. So x mu commutated with x nu is, uh, is lambda, some Planck scale parameter, times epsilon. And the theorem is, because this Lie algebra is simple, its co-cycles, its cohomology is trivial, so using some, el some elementary facts from mathematics, you can prove that there exists no pre lie structure. So there exists no three-dimensional differential calculus on this algebra. So I wrote down some very elementary axioms, which everybody could agree with. But this very simple example, which surely occurs in the real world, if anything occurs, um, uh, doesn't admit such a, such a, such a, doesn't obey those axioms. So what to do? Um, I'll come, so I'll explain, I'll, I'll come back to this example uh, in about 10 minutes. Uh, just let's go a little bit further. I'm not, this talk isn't about the running geometry, so I'm only going to give you a glimpse of this. But what is a metric? If, once we know omega 1, um, we can define a metric as a tensor. So omega 1, tensor omega 1. So something like g is g mu nu, dx mu, dx mu, like this. We want it to be symmetric, so that's expressed by saying that the wedge product of g should be 0. We want there to be an inverse. So the inverse goes the other way from... Uh, two one forms, we can take the inner product, and that gives us a function. And we want them to be inverse. So for every omega, applying g, applying the inverse to get back to omega. This just says that, um, that round bracket is inverse to g. But the new thing, which you might not get if you weren't, didn't think carefully, 
you really need this round bracket to commute with functions in the following way, that you can bring a function inside. So if I have a function times a one form, I can bring it inside, I've, I've, it will give the same. Similarly, this way. Now, you need that because if you want to contract, let's say you want to apply the round bracket in the first two indices, this tensor product over A means you can move an A from one side to the other side. So that you cannot contract it, it would not make sense unless you have, you can take the A inside or not as you wish. So these axioms are quite strong, but again, they are the minimum that you want to do anything functional with a metric. Now, what you discover is that these axioms, again, as with the Leibniz rule, they kind of trip over each other, and you discover that this very simple requirement forces the metric to be central. So A times G should be G times A, even though the algebra A is not commutative and the differentials are not commutative. And that's a, that's a constraint, which again, you do not see classically. Classically, you can have any metric you like. But when the algebra is very non-commutative, that will be a strong constraint. So, uh, so this is a big constraint in the quantum case and implies that only cert certain metrics can arise. This is what I alluded to in the beginning. But again, it's not coming from hard mathematics. It's coming just from the axioms. Okay, um, okay here's an example. I did talk about this in 2000, oops, I did talk about this in 2016 in Krakow, so I'll only say this one slide very briefly. But what I explained uh, a couple of, two years ago was in this example here, here's an example of quantum space-time. Xi and T don't commute. They, their computation relation is a multiple of Xi. The, the, there is a natural difference, so this, this is a two-dimensional Lie algebra. It does have admit pre-Lie algebras. It admits two distinct pre-Lie algebra structures. So there are two distinct Translation invariant calculi. This is one of them. There's a parameter alpha, which we can just transform away by a change of variables. Uh, but anyway, uh, so it's essentially there's one differential calculus uh, of this type. And, that, and then if you combine spherical symmetry, or just if you have one dimension, then you just have one variable r, um, that plus the centrality being, being central is so such a strong requirement, it forces a unique metric. The metric has to be this, the quantum metric. And, that's, and, and that is actually, in the classical limit, that becomes the Totti robinson metric. So that is a solution of Einstein's equation with Maxwell field and cosmological constant. But this comes out of nothing except the axioms and my assumption that this is my algebra and my assumption that this is my differential calculus, which is my solution of the Leibniz rule. So from that, I am forced, uh, and, and here, I, let's say we're in one dimension, then what you get is the sitter anti -sitter, -sitter metric. And then just centrality, which is a requirement of a metric. So if you, if you do it if, when we're just one variable r instead of xi, so, uh, so the two-dimensional one space, one time, then, central, then spherical symmetry is not relevant. So centrality, which is, one of, which is coming out of the axis of a metric, forces this unique form. So, um, so, uh, so that's very striking. But there's one other choice of calculus, which is you can take the same algebra but there's another pre lie structure, which, is, which, is, which gives you this calculus. Again, you can focus on beta equals 1, and let's focus on n equals 2, so 1 space, 1 time. And then you are forced to this unique metric, which is, again, a quantum metric. In the classical limit, what you discover is you have a Ricci singularity at the r equals 0, which you can interpret as a very strong gravitational source at the origin, or if you change variables, depending on the sign of b, if b, if b is one signature, then you should change variables, and you really, what you really have is a, time, a singularity of the origin. You replace swap x and t, and what you then have is an expanding cosmology. So you, up to a parameter, you have a unique form of metric, and depending on whether the parameter is positive or real, uh, positive or negative, you either have a, a point source or an expanding universe. But again, this comes out of nothing but just this intrinsic structure of this algebra and one of my two choices of differential calculus. So this is an example of how physics emerges out of just the Leibniz rule and requirement of invertible metric. Okay. Uh, I'm really not going to talk about differential geometry given the time is quite short, but just to give you a flavor, you can go much further. So you can define a connection by Christoffel symbols. So a connection, I'm thinking of it a little bit weirdly, but it's a covariant derivative for me uh, is a map from uh, one forms into one form tensor one form. If you have a vector field, you can evaluate it against this uh, argument and get an operator, a covariant derivative, along the vector field. Um, now, this map, Nabla should obey the Leibniz rule on one side. This goes back a long way in mathematics. 
and more recently, in the 80s, uh, well, maybe 90s, um, people began to think about the non-commutative version. And from then, from the right-hand side, we also want the Leibniz rule. But there is a problem. I want to be able to take f out, so I want a term like this. But I also want a term with omega and df. But df is in the wrong place. df has to go to the far left, where it will evaluate against a vector field, right? All my vector fields will be evaluated against my, diff my omega 1. And to obey something like a Leibniz rule, it would have to couple with df. So I need some kind of map sigma, which flips the, t which flips the order. Sorry. Um, Okay, so, so that's called a bimodule connection. Um, that's an additional property. So not every connection has this extra strong property. Uh, but when it does, then I can tensor product them. So if I've got two, uh, if I've got two, uh, 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 if I've got something element of omega one, tensor of omega one, I can apply Nabla first to the one factor, then to the other factor. Now the left output of, of, nab, of this Nabla eta, the left output is, is what I'm going to evaluate against a vector field. And I can use sigma to move it to the far left so that everything then makes sense. So this gives you a well-defined notion of, well, this gives you a new connection on the tensor product of differential forms. And now it makes sense to write down nabla g is 0 because g is an element of omega 1 tensor omega 1. So basically, there is a very reasonable notion of connection and a very reasonable notion of metric compatibility. There's also you need a notion of torsion. Torsion turns out to be just that there are two ways to go from omega 1 to omega 2. One is to apply the differential D, and the other is to apply Nabla, and then apply the wedge product. And torsion-free means those two directions commute. This is the geometric meaning, the algebraic meaning, I should say, of the torsion tensor in Iranian geometry. So a quantum leverage EV connection is one which is torsion-free and metric compatible. Then you can define curvature. It's basically the square. You can define a Laplacian. You can look at the star structures. You want the metric to be Hermitian. You want the Christoffel symbols to be Hermitian. You can define the Ricci tensor, okay, and so on. I just want to say that I'm not going to talk about it in today's talk, but it can be done. I have a book coming out on it with Edwin Beggs. But in this book, we only do the mathematics, and what is, remains a deep mystery is what is the Einstein tensor? What is the stress tensor? So although we can do a lot of mathematics, and it's very natural, the really physical questions are still unanswered. And I think for that, we really need some new philosophical input as to what they should really be. Okay. But meanwhile, we're going to now backtrack and just look in the remainder of the talk, just look at differential calculus. So we're going to go back to that example. So you can do a lot more, but in this talk, I'll just look at, this ca at the calculus. Go back to that example. So I've, I've, um, uh, I've, I've dropped the indices, and I've called them i for, rather than mu for, for some reasons that will become clear. And I'm also going to call lambda i lambda p. So lambda p is the Planck scale parameter, possibly. It doesn't have to be. Uh, and I'm going to work with a complex parameter just to stop having i's everywhere. So this is my angular momentum algebra. Uh, and now there is it. Now I said there is no three-dimensional differential calculus. So you can ask, well, what is there? So you can look at, look at high-dimensional calculus. And the smallest rotationally invariant differential calculus, there's a unique one, uh, which is dimension four. What you have to do is you have to take the obvious thing if you differentiate this. You, would, you might expect this. But this would not be associative, would not be the Jacobi identity. But, but if you have an extra dimension, theta, which obeys uh, with this commutation relation, and theta is actually inner, then that is a 4D calculus. So it's exactly what I promised you. I said that typically in the quantum world, there will be an element theta, which obeys this, which generates differentials. I said if you don't put it in, you cannot obey the axioms in this example. If you do put it in, you can obey the axioms. So this is how you see that you need this element theta. It exists in the quantum world, whether you like it or not. If you didn't have it, you'd be forced to adjoin it uh, by having an extra dimension calculus. Then you have an associative differential calculus, you obey all the axioms. Now, you can take a function f, and you can expand it in this basis. So expanding it in this basis, this defines the di operators. They are non-commutative operators on my algebra f. f is an element of usu2. So it's a non-commutative non polynomial in the x size. Df is this partial derivative defined by the as the coefficient of dxi and um, some coefficient of theta. And I'm going to call this this operator. Why? Because this operator, you can compute it looks like this. And in the limit lambda goes to 0, this operator becomes the Laplacian. So this extra dimension has a physical meaning. It's partial derivatives in this extra dimension that you don't see in the classical world. 
is nothing other than, evolution, than the evolution operator, is the Laplacian. Um, you can go a little bit further. You can, in this five dimension, in this four dimensional calculus, there is now, uh, there is a metric, a quantum metric. So this is a quantum metric for the calculus. You see that it's the flat metric on R3 plus a metric in this extra dimension. Now, you could very well ask, why have I got this extra dimension? Surely this, this extra theta is D of something, is a differential form. So, so it isn't, but you can adjoin it. You can extend the algebra. You can adjoin a new variable T to my angular momentum algebra. And I can have T commuting, so T commutes with the Xi's, uh, and with theta is DT. And then you see this becomes the Minkowski metric. And the, the, there are commutation relations between the T's with itself, which is this one, and with, the, with Xi and the DT, which is this one. These are all forced by the algebra. So the four-dimensional calculus, the calculus is forcibly four-dimensional. Therefore, it's begging to be the differentials for a four-dimensional algebra. And that extra, extra variable that you have to adjoin is time. Uh, I called it T. Uh, and, then, and then the metric, the unique, the unique rotational invariant metric, which is this one, becomes exactly the Minkowski metric. So you're forced to have that. And the, 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 the coefficient, then this interpretation of theta is now dt. And so this, so this coefficient is now the partial derivative in the time direction. So what you've got is that d by dt is, is the Laplacian. So you've got Schrodinger's equation. So this is a toy model, but you can see the flavor of how a lot of physics is emerging out of nothing but my axioms of the Leibniz rule and my requirement to have a, the right dimensional calculus. Okay. So, um, so this is this is work I did uh, some years ago, gosh, uh, thirteen years ago. I want to show you um, now what I've been doing since then, which is more of the uh, sort of thinking more about geometry. This is like a baby example. How can we see Riemannian geometry more generally emerging? And of course, this is going to be more mathematical. So I apologize to those who are already finding it too mathematical. Um, but I'll try to explain just the ideas, uh, okay? So the idea is, it's a new mechanism. It's in this paper. There's also a conference proceeding published uh, somewhere. Um, um, but the long paper is, maybe it's a little bit ahead of its time. Um, uh, it's a mechanism which I call co-cycle central extension. And I'm gonna ask the following question. Um, okay, in the real world, the hypothesis is, is that classical differential structure as we know it, classical geometry, everything as we know it, is the limit of a quantum one. But we don't know the quantum one, so let's try to work backwards. Let's suppose we have a classical differential calculus, so we have a manifold, no metric, just a manifold, differential calculus, exterior forms. How many ways can we quantize it? How many ways can we go backwards to get a quantum one? And to make this uh, and I want to analyze the moduli of all possible ones. But to make this manageable, I'm going to look at not any possible quantum one, but at what I call central extensions. So I'm going to ask how many ways can you ext centrally extend classical um, differential structures within the axioms of a quantum differential structure uh, as a central extension. And what I mean by central extension is what I explain here. So firstly, the kind of I'm going to be at central extension means I'm going to extend it in just a little bit non-commutative in one variable. And so that I'm going to add one differential form. There's a, there's a prime missing here. Omega of a point is going to be just functions, that's a point, and one differential, theta prime, there's a prime missing. Theta prime squared is zero, d theta prime is zero. That is an example of a differential calculus, a very silly one. That's a that's the differential calculus of a point. And I want to ask, given any other calculus, omega a, so a is any algebra. In my example, it will be C infinity of m. And then omega will be a calculus on a. In my example, it will be the usual exterior algebra. I want to ask how many ways can I extend it to a bigger calculus, omega tilde, which contains the extension in such a way, this is a bit like in Fred and Huggins' talk, in such a way that omega tilde as a vector space is built up from just the differentials that you began with and the extra di direction theta. So how many ways can I adjoin just one single generator, um, which, is, which graded commutes, so it's central, um, 
that's it. And now I want to put a little bit, and I want this condition here, our vector space, we call that a cleft extension if this map projection commutes with multiplication by functions. So I wanted to commute with functions on the left because I can multiply by function on the left here and on the left here, and I want those to coincide. So I want this to be a map which respects left multiplication. So that's called a cleft extension. So that's what I'm really interested in, cleft extensions of, uh, of the classical differential calculus. And I'm going to ask, say that this is flat if this calculus is equivalent to one where D is not deformed. Um, when I, what I mean by equivalent means that you can have a map between extensions. So if I've got one extension till, another extension till prime, then a map between them means a map of differential algebras which, where this diagram commutes. Um, and which preserve, yeah. So, so, in, so if there is an equivalent one where D is undeformed, the, the, til, the D till, the D of this, of this algebra is effectively, is equivalent to being undeformed, then we call that flat. So, that is a, that is, so this, is, this is my axiomatization of the problem. How many ways can I quantize a classical calculus? I've expressed it as an extension problem. And now here's the answer. Proposition, extensions of, uh, are equivalent to the following data. A degree zero map, delta, and a degree minus two map. That means a double square, bra double bracket. The double bracket map means it lowers the degree by two obeying this co-cycle condition. So the, the here, omega, eta, and zeta are arbitrary, one for arbitrary forms of any degree. And this delta obeys this leibniz eta condition. So that the L delta is, de or L of any operator, is defined as the failure of the Leibniz rule. So it's called the leibniz eta. And so the leibniz eta of delta should be related to the, 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 the double, the, the, this other part of the co-cycle. So this is data I call a co-cycle. And, uh, and then given this data, I define the extension as follows. D tilde has the same form as in my example, as in my little example I showed you, is the, cla the, uh, the classical D omega plus the central extension. And the central extension part uh, has a coefficient which is given by delta. And the extended wedge product is the classical wedge product plus this thing given by the double, uh, by this bracket. And so, and, and conversely, any extension is of this form. Any cleft extension is of this form. So just you may know that group, in group theory, group central extensions are classified by two co-cycles. I'm saying the same thing now for differential structures. Um, and the requiring it to be cleft turns out to be that this bracket is always zero. And uh, we can analyze what it means for two co-cycles to be equivalent, the way I told you. It turns out the equivalence of different central extensions given by different co-cycles corresponds to a degree minus one map between them, obeying this condition, relating the two. So any degree minus one map, delta, induces a, uh, an, an equivalence uh, like this, or a transformation of, of the co-cycle. So this is like a, when you, when you talk about co-cycles, you usually mean up to some co-boundary. This is the co-boundary operation. Um, and now, uh, given uh, and, and the, the, um, okay. the flat case, the case we're interested in, is the case where after transformation, um, delta prime is zero. So that corresponds, well, to put it the other way around, uh, not worrying about the sign, it says that the thing is flat if and only if delta has a specific form for some delta, some little delta. So this is the form that you discover in, when, you do Hodge, when you do geometry using Hodge's approach. This is, becomes the Hodge co-differential. Um, okay, so that's a, that's a, th this is abstract theory. Um, now we can do a little bit more. Um, let M uh, be, uh, so we're going to apply this. So that's the abstract theory works for any algebra. It doesn't even have to be commutative. But now we're going to apply that theory to uh, the case where I have a manifold M. I have a differential structure, so omega of M. So A in, my, in the general theory is T infinity of M. Omega of A is now differential forms on M. That is a manifold, no metric. And the theorem is, is that this data, the, uh, so the cleft central extensions, so the data for a cleft central extension, are exactly the same data as a metric and a connection compatible with it. In, the, in, in a slightly general, slightly weaker sense than usual, the metric is, is given from the co-cycle 
from the, from the, from the, ang for the, from the co-cycle where one argument is a function. And the, the connection is given uh, by the same thing, by the co-cycle, where, where both arguments are one forms. This gives you a covariant derivative of a long omega. So in the non-degenerate case, that would be uh, the same thing as a vector field and uh, via the metric. And then this would be a usual connection. So, uh, and so this, is, this slightly generalizes Romanian geometry in the sense that I don't require the metric to be non-degenerate yet. And this connection is not quite me uh, metric compatible. The covariant derivative of the connection of the metric turns out to be given by the torsion. So of course, a special case is when the torsion is zero. So, so simply analyzing what are all the possible cleft extensions, the, all the possible ways to quantize a classical differential structure within the axioms of a quantum differential structure at a central extension is equivalent to specifying a metric and a connection obeying a slightly weaker version of, of, metric, of the levitch theta condition. Uh, if you, so this is, if to my mind, this is the origin, because I believe that quantum differential calculus exists, when working it the other way, this will be the origin of why we have Riemannian structure, why we have a metric compatible connection. Um, there is a little bit more you can say. Um, you also have an inferior product. Um, okay, let me not worry about this. Um, what I want to say is, is from the various things I've told you, you can reconstruct the inner product in terms of the Lovnitziator of two functions. And this tells you that you can, re knowing the co-cycle, you know delta. From delta, you can reconstruct the metric. And so that's why the co-cycle is, uh, is really the data that you want. Okay, um, now, if you ask additionally that the extension is flat, so a flat, so one which is equivalent to D not being deformed, that tells you that delta has to have the specific form for some degree minus one map. Um, then in our classical case, this delta will be, um, uh, well, you can, the, the um, uh, well, the, th the theorem is, is that this is exactly, uh, well, okay, I have to back up a little bit. From the Leibniziator of delta, uh, which is basically this equation here, from the failure of delta to, to for the Leibniz rule to hold for, for delta, you can reconstruct the metric. And we say that delta is symmetric if, uh, if this resulting thing is symmetric. Otherwise, it could be slightly more general. So, um, and, that, and that is the case in our setting, in, in the example that we had. For, so, so the result is that for a cleft, Central extension is um, is is flat um, if and only if um, uh, the um, the torsion is zero and the um, well if and only if delta is of this given by some co-differential delta um, and in this case you discover the torsion is zero so I haven't written it but you can also do it all the way around so torsion free flat connections, uh, tors not flat, torsion-free, and, and therefore leverage of eta, because if t is zero, then my previous condition says that my metric compatibility holds. This is zero. So when you add the requirement that the extension is flat, that forces the torsion to be zero. And then what you've exactly done is exactly characterize Riemannian geometry. So Riemannian geometry is nothing other than equivalent to a flat, central ex a flat cleft central extension. What you discover is a new way of thinking about Riemannian geometry. So in particular, um, you get, get a new formula for the leverage of eta connection. This applies on any Riemannian manifold. So if I give you an honest Riemannian manifold uh, with a metric, delta can be the Hodge co-differential. From the co-differential, you can extract the metric. So actually, delta is more primitive data. From this formula, which is the Leibniziator for delta, the del failure of delta to obey the Leibniz rule, and some interior products, you discover the leverage of eta connection. So there's a new formula, which is not known in literature, as far as I can tell. But even more, when using this technology, you can discover that when you apply delta to a triple product of forms, it obeys this six-term relation. And this tells you that every Riemannian manifold with delta is actually a batali vilkovsky algebra, which is also not known. So these are new results about classical Riemannian geometry coming out of this co-cycle point of view. Um, and the, um, the case of interest, of course, in classical Riemannian geometry is where delta squared is zero. Um, and that would, yeah, so, I mean, that's not required in analysis, but that's also true in the classical Riemannian geometry case. 
Now, one more remark I want to make. It's just at the bottom here. Um, delta extends in a canonical way to products, tensor products. When you apply it to the metric, so I don't know if you can see it here, but in the corner here, delta applied to the metric turns out to be the Ricci tensor. So the Ricci tensor has the meaning of the Laplacian, the Hodge Laplacian extended to tensor products on the metric. And that means that Einstein's equation has the meaning of a wave equation, delta G is a multiple of G. The cosmic constant is basically the, the mass, something like that. The, uh, uh, the, um, so it's just that this is, this is only, uh, this, these are not, these are not um, this is equivalent to what you already know. It's just packaged in a, in a way that is, it makes you realize that it has the similar form as a wave equation when looked at the right way. Okay, I'm just about to finish uh, my talk. I've got three minutes left. Um, I just want to say that this, so, okay, so I mean, really, that's the most important part of my talk, that classical geometry arises in this, can be seen to arise within this very limited class of quantum uh, differential calculi from the Leibniz rule. I just want to mention that this whole philosophy works perfectly well when the algebra A is already non-commutative. So this allows you to construct quantum Riemannian geometry. So we can, t we can look for a, cl a cleft flat central extension of A where A is already non-commutative. Um, we can still go through the same steps. We'll get a connection defined by the co-cycle. We will get, we will get, it will be a bimodule connection. There'll be this map sigma. Um, there'll be an interior product. What you discover is it doesn't, uh, it's not, uh, it's the analysis for the, co for the, for the um, metric compatibility. It's more complicated now. Um, but uh, so, it's, so it's not quantum leverage of eta right away. Uh, but also there's a way to construct these things. And the way to construct these things is as follows. Let this per be a degree minus two map such that this four term relation holds. So here's a construction for co-cycles. So uh, maybe, maybe, sorry, I didn't really explain myself very well. So we've, we've got that this, we're now working the other way around. We want to use the same connection, but now we want to start with a quantum out calculus and use this construction to, by constructing a co-cycle to get the quantum Riemannian structure. And so here's a method to construct co-cycles. Start with a degree minus two map called perp, obeying this four-term relation. Let delta be any degree minus one operator with this compatibility condition. Then there is a cleft central extension given by these formulae. Classically, perp is just the metric. Given any two, any one form, any forms, I can take the metric in all different places of these one forms, omega i, and this gives you a solution of these equations. So basically, this map perp classically would extend to this, uh, would extend to omega. It's like the metric induced on omega. And in the quantum case, we don't have this picture, but we just require this. Then the whole thing works. And here's just an example to end. If I take this algebra I began my talk with, this, uh, this one that had this, cos this, cos this um, Bertotti Robinson solution or the sitter space, uh, then here's the calculus we had before with alpha, we can set alpha equals one. These one forms are central in this calculus. And therefore, I can analyze, I can construct omega. The, the exterior algebra is just given by the, the Grassmann algebra on these basic one forms. So these basic one forms anti commute. There is a top form vol. Uh, then I can solve for perp. I can solve that four term relation. And it turns out that there is a solution for every, every matrix bij of constant coefficients. I get a solution for generic values. And, as, uh, and assuming delta, I can find delta with, I can find delta. And if I choose delta to be a bimodule map, then it forces the metric to be given like this. So this is the form of metric. So this whole process works. And I can get uh, uh, any, this is the last slide. So um, I can get uh, any, uh, more or less. Uh, so I can get, um, you put me off now. I can get um, uh, any symmetric metric this way. If I take the other calculus, um, this is the other differential calculus. Remember, there were two. These are now the central one forms. Now it turns out the solutions are different. I can only solve for any one parameter b, I, I get a solution of this unique form. And again, the same requirements, delta squared, a bimodule map, um, forces my metric to look like this. This is not what you expected. This is a deformation of an anti symmetric metric. So this philosophy doesn't give you every possible metric that you might have hoped for. 
in the, in, for this calculus, it gives you a deformation of a classical metric, which is symmetric. This one it gives you a deformation of an anti-symmetric metric. So this suggests that actually we should think a little bit more generally uh, of, symmet sort of symmetric and anti-symmetric things mixed together. And what really is my last slide is just to mention that I'm not going to go through it, but you can apply this for in higher dimensions. There's a theorem uh, for any conformal killing vector. You get a calculus with an extra dimension, theta prime. The coefficient of that dimension is a wave operator. You can apply this to the Schwarzschild black hole and get a wave operator for the quantum deformation of the Schwarzschild black hole. And it has new physics. That's what I want to end with. You get the new physics that the wave, that the uh, uh, gravitational redshift is frequency dependent. So although I've been talking about philosophy, there is the possibility of physics as well. Thank you. Yep, please. Um, uh, yes, absolutely. It's a very good, very good, it's a very, very nice problem because this is a theorem, so it will apply. Each of those different fake R4s, etc., will give you a different central extension. Uh, and yes, it's a very, it's a, it could provide a framework. You can analyze central extensions. You can maybe get, recover the classification of differential structures. It's very possible. I know you would. I remember talking to you two years ago. <laughs> right. Yeah, there was one comment, namely, uh, it seems to me that Quantum metric should imply some uncertainty relation. Some what? Uh, should imply uncertainty relations, like Heisenberg, in yeah. this sense. Then my question is, uh, can we de derive such you uncertainty can. relation? No, the, the problem is that, that, that it, we interpreted time. Time is a parameter in the, the classical theory. Is to yeah. here is some um, yes. observable. Then this yes. is, this is a, big, it's a, it's a big very, very, it's a very, very good question. Uh, it's a big yeah, gap. It's Absolutely, a big gap. I, I, I'd be the first to agree with that. And even this particular algebra, this particular one here, uh, has goes back to the 90s. And this question you're asking has still not been solved. Okay. So what people do in literature is they kind of they just take things a little bit heuristically. You can, you can solve, you can find the plane waves for this calculus. And so they are, have a form of an exponential, e to the i x, e to the i t, where x and t don't commute. And you can just, you can say, let's suppose that these quantum waves match to the classical waves that you, that you might measure. And then you can make an interpretation without knowing exactly what, you know, how you're measuring time. But a better way is to construct representations of this quantum algebra and then have expectation values for different values of t. But, it, uh, and, but and this has not really been explored as much as it should do. And then, um, because you do have interpretational philosophical questions, if you are looking at expectation value, you know, what is the external time within which that quantum mechanics is taking place? So these problems have not been solved, and they're very good ones. Okay, yeah, I think we have to go to the next lecture. So thank you again for the lecture. <clears throat>